Good afternoon, everyone. This is our eighth fireside chat on research transitions, which is pretty amazing. I'm Fiona Horstel, as Kitty mentioned, and I'm the director of the Office of Research Transition and Application, uh, more affectionately known as ORTA. And one of ORTA's roles is to provide transition support with the objective of accelerating transitions across NOAA and simplifying the transition process in general. Uh, the goal of these fireside chats on research transitions to provide participants with a broader understanding of R&D um, research and development transition at NOAA. And as I mentioned, even though I'm based in OAR, we do serve all of NOAA. Um, and I want to thank my staff for pulling this all together. It's, it's quite a yeoman's effort. Um, so the goal of this particular fireside chat will be to understand key considerations that can be taken into account upfront to enable transitions to move forward to implementation. Um, considerations may include factors such as ensuring adequate and sustained funding throughout the R2X um, or R2 um, transition across the board, commercialization operations, applications, et cetera, um, pipeline, establishing essentially a handshake between the developer and the end user, and checking that software is compatible and other considerations. This event will offer perspectives from across NOAA line offices. You can see our panel here. And um, regarding these pathways to implementation and examples of their successes. Um, the session will be moderated by Lonnie Gonzalez, um, who is the Stressor Detection and Impacts Division Chief in the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science and the new chair of the Line Office Transition Managers Committee, more actually known as the LOTMC. So we'll start our remarks <clears throat> from Michelle Mainelli, the Acting Deputy Director of the National Weather Service, and follow with a conversation from our panelists for an in-depth look into the diversity of processes and steps that are in place across the NOAA line offices to ensure successful research transitions. So we encourage you to ask questions through the chat box. Questions will be sent um, to Katie from the NOAA library, who you've been introduced to and she will pose them to the panelists in the second half of the event. If there's not enough time to answer all the questions, questions will be answered directly via email after the session. And as I mentioned, I have staff on board here who are taking notes and documenting those questions. Just a note, on our website, we have a feedback form. Um, we are collecting information on transition support, including a question on these particular fireside chats um, to see how we can better serve our audiences. So now it is my pleasure to welcome Michelle Mainelli. Michelle and I go back a long way and I think she's going to tell some nasty stories about me. But Michelle is the acting NWS Deputy Director and has served in various roles in NWS for more than 30 years. More recently, or most recently, she has served in several executive leadership, leadership positions within NWS. But prior to that, she served at several NWS field positions too, um, including at NCEP Central Operations, in all branches of the National Hurricane Center, where she was for 15 years and where I met Michelle, and at the beginning of her career as an intern in WFO St. Louis. Michelle holds a BS in Meteorology, an MS in Meteorology and Physical Oceanography, and an MBA in Technology Management. So Michelle, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Fiona. Uh, so welcome, everybody. So yeah, so when Fiona approached me to open up this fireside chat on pathways to implementation, I couldn't say no. Uh, we do go back uh, a pretty far way back in our careers working together, and we did exactly this. We transitioned research projects, you know, outcomes to operations, applications, and services that decision makers need to uh, need to make, so that R2X. So we were on that 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 front lines with this, but back then the focus was small. Um, it was only for the you know at, within the the hurricane center of where we worked. Um, assimilation of one data set into a model, the creation of a graphical product for one particular use case, uh, implementation of new data sets into operations for visualization purposes was like for one, maybe two national centers, but not not for the enterprise, um, not in a manner that other offices could take advantage of. Uh, were we successful, right, Fioni? Absolutely, we were totally successful in what we did. Will we be successful in that approach today? I'm not so sure. Just with the funding and what, you know, the greater pieces of where our focus, what we need to do across NOAA and across uh, line offices. 
Uh, so sec successful transition, um, in my opinion, of R2X, it requires that strong, consistent, and collaborative coordination within NOAA across line offices and fields within the weather enterprise. And it, it needs to be at the beginning, at the very start of these projects. When you look at successful transitions, they must address the cost of the transition but not only just the cost of getting that transition, but also the cost of support, the other side, once it kind of you throw that over the fence, so to speak. What's the cost of operations and maintenance on that? Who is going to be responsible for that long term of what I like to call that tier three support, the development, you know, versus the original development org? In a lot of cases, and I look at today in, in Weather Service, what we have in operations, and a lot of cases that original dev org development organization is still that reach back that our operations folks, if they can't solve it within that 24 by seven, there's that reach back or versus the host organization. If it's the host organization, there's going to need to be training in, in, in various pieces. So I think it's really important to figure out those roles or responsibilities and that cost factor early on. Uh, before going into, you know, of what to try to be successful in that transition. Uh, prototyping applications, uh, very good for demonstrating new functionality and concepts, um, but they're not always good candidates for operational implementation, and I think that's okay. And I, there's a lot of focus that we put on, okay, if we prototype an application and demonstrates a functionality, if it doesn't get into operations, that's failure. And it's not. It shouldn't be. We shouldn't, we should be able to have the space as we coordinate across line offices to be able to demonstrate and try new prototypes, new demonstrations of potential areas of research of where they could be implemented into operations and what we gain from that and saying, you know what, that's not going to work. It's okay, let's step back and try something else. I think we also need to be cognizant that every single thing that we do in the research may not get to operations in that final implementation. It's more important on what we learned from that and making the next piece that we go into, maybe something else is gonna fit that, fit that build. Uh, as far as with those transition plans, I'd say, you know, it, good transition plans um, starts with funded project plans. Right, you could only do you know the 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 work on everybody's in it, and we have the motivation. You it needs to be funded. It needs to have that support all the way through, and especially the support of you know the leadership chains on on both of those those line offices. Um, by demonstrating, going through demonstration and trying things, it does reduce risk by providing you know, concepts before investing in that full transition O&M costs. Uh, we do that with data buys. We've done that with on the weather side, uh, weather service side with NWS chat um, powered by Slack. We went through a technical analysis of our chat capability and it was a homegrown application and we looked at various COT solutions, commercial off the shelf solutions on what could replace that. We went through various things. We found Slack met most of those. We did a small demonstration in a small area and said, okay, let's see if this works and it meets our requirements before we invested in a five, 10 year contract. And it worked and we spent a small amount of money, tested that, and now we're launching, I think we have close to 13,000 users, um, tests uh, that our folks are getting trained or we're going to be deploying out into operations next month uh, with using Slack as that interface uh, for our uh, collaboration with the uh, internally as well as with our decision makers. Uh, another case, when you look at data buys, in 2022, the National Data Buoy Center deployed uncrewed surface vehicles to address uh, in operational need, we had weather buoy networks, unplanned primary measurement outages, um, like surface air pressure, surface wind. So there were gaps in our observation space and we were going into hurricane season. Uh, and it was critical for monitoring, you know, tropical cyclones, you know, intensity and various pieces uh, that go with that. So this approach by having 
a a short kind of demonstration all right let's let's put deploy some of these vehicles it helped number one improve the overall data availability of the network and it provided accurate in situ observations used to improve hurricane landfall intensity predictions what it also did is provided a a really good snapshot hey can this be scaled did it work how is the implementation? How did the data come into operations? Were we able to view it? Were we able to view it on their systems? What were the gaps? Uh, so looking at those types of things and those demonstrations can be provide a huge amount of value to our organizations. Uh, many R&D projects, uh, you know, they add value to the operations, but we have to prioritize. We can't do everything. So figuring out and determining what are the most critical needs and offer the most transformational value and provide solutions that can be expanded to include multiple, multiple service program areas. You know, if you're touching fire weather, tropical, marine, aviation, having solutions that can span the service programs, uh, the level for success, I believe, increases. Uh, and so it's striking that, you know, the balance between the operations pull and the RD push and, and what that is. Uh, I also think with, you know, R2X organizations, you have to keep up the pace with changing operational priorities. So this translates to deliberate communication and collaboration, knowing where an organization needs to be five, 10 years to remain relevant, nimble, flexible, transforming its services to be impact-based decision support services, and understanding the risks based on the confidence in each forecast and the range of outcome. What's the best case? What's the worst case? So when you're looking at new tools of research, what is going to provide that transformational benefit? You have to think of that entire value chain uh, within our organizations. Um, so looking at most recently in, in May, so I'm one of the co-chairs on the NOAA Observing Systems Council, the NOSC, and in May of this year, we convened a two-day strategic retreat. And we had six plenary sessions across two days, um, you know, focused on observing systems, associated user observation requirements, impacts on products and services. Uh, and then we focused on data assimilation, dissemination and management of all that data. And okay, where do you start, right? We have this huge value chain. You have your observational infrastructure, you know, data information, you go into research development. We have our modeling prediction. I mean, this is, if you look at, you know, our strategic plan across NOAA, it's the last thing of getting from our observing infrastructure to our service delivery and decision support tools. So how do we optimize that first step of the composition of our NOAA Observing system portfolio, it, it is, it's a critical first step on getting to that service delivery and decision support tools. It requires continuous effort to match observational capabilities with mission requirements and to efficiently maintain or replace current capabilities. So looking at balancing these factors, it requires that system-based approach to optimize cost, safety, and value. So when we're looking at how to, how to be successful in this. You have to look at the, the the system and including those factors as well of how do we get that cost and that value? What's the rate of and you know and, and how do we measure that? How do we measure? We we go so so many times with the metrics of what is successful. Um, looking at that last piece and that delivery factor, um, more metrics based upon that like the so what factor, if this is implemented, what does society gain from that? What is the, you know, life saved, also the economic, you know, enhancing the national economy as well in what we do. Uh, so we're focused across NOAA and multiple key areas related to NOAA's earth system modeling. So I focused on the, the observations, but there's also, you know, those observations, the earth system modeling and data assimilation environmental observations and getting all that into the spectrum here. Um, our highest priority right now, if you look at from an observational perspective, not only is it to get that diversity of, you know, what do we own versus what do we buy, um, we have to strengthen our data assimilation capabilities. 
um, with sustained investments in research infrastructure, you know, what gets done on our high-performance computing, what can be done in the cloud, um, getting our workforce skill development, recruitment. I mean, all that kind of goes into this. So when you start thinking of you want to do, you know, implement research projects and be successful into operations, you have to think about the infrastructure that those projects are going to have to sit on. How do we look forward of, of that specialized ex expertise um, in maximizing the utilization of our environmental observations all the way through that data assimilation? Um, you know, and, and how, you know, can they be effectively implemented? You know, we're, we're looking now, we're reviewing and updating our HPC governance structure and allocation process right now. Um, we, we do have a finite supercomputing resources. Everybody is trying to get a piece of those. Um, how do you transition some of those well-tested R&D models to the cloud, creating incentives and mechanisms and merging, you know, models with HPC and AI and ML. Gosh, I could go on and on. Like you can take this of how we do our research and implement successfully into operations. You could look at it from an observational piece, a modeling piece, those tools and applications. Um, at the bottom line, to be successful across NOAA and across our line offices, we got to collaborate. We got to communicate as early as possible. We got, we need to, our, our money isn't endless. Our funding challenges across NOAA are going to be more so, I think, in the coming years. Uh, and so to be successful, we have to focus on more, less of reinventing and more on collaborating on what are those joint priorities that we're going to do. Focus on those priorities. We can't do everything. We can't be everything to everybody. And focusing on those and collaborating more and having joint line office, uh, you know, focused areas to implement, I think are gonna get us there. So a um, lot there. Um, Fiona, I'm gonna pass it back to you, but that, that's how I would kind of start this off in this discussion. I'm very passionate about this. So I'm excited that thank you for inviting me to give some opening remarks. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. And I do recall the days when we were um, implementing all kinds of stuff at the Hurricane Center and it was ad hoc, nothing very formalized. It was just throwing it out what I call on deck on to the hurricane specialist. So thank you very much for those remarks. And I particularly resonate with the fact that you mentioned that um, just because something doesn't get implemented is not a failure. Um, and, you know, I was speaking with a colleague recently um, who was saying that it's a forecast failure that leads to um, forecast improvement. And um, if that's the O2R piece. So um, thanks very much again, Michelle, for your comments. I hope you can stay online with us for a little bit longer. Um, I would now like to formally introduce Lonnie Gonzalez, who will moderate this discussion. He will also introduce the panelists. But I'm going to tell you that he's the Division Chief for the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science Stressor Detection and Impacts Division. He leads strategic planning, resourcing and coordination of an applied research and development portfolio spanning the core areas of coastal contamination, harmful algal blooms and hypoxia, coral health and habitat quality, and development of new technologies to advance stressor detection and observing capabilities. Lonnie also serves, as I mentioned, as the uh, chair of the Line Office Transition Managers Committee, Management Committee, um, where he helps to drive successful transition of NOAA research and development into applications, operations, and commercialization. As I said, that's the X piece and other uses. Um, uh, Lonnie is a member of the Cross Node Community of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Champions. He serves as the co technical monitor for the NOAA Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems and has led multiple cross-line, um, cross NOAA initiatives to drive DEIA through science and workforce recruitment efforts. So with that, Lonnie, please go ahead and take it away. Uh, so yes, so good afternoon. Uh, good morning if you're on the West Coast there. Uh, great to be here. Thank you again, Fiona, for the invite to moderate. Uh, appreciate your team and all the work that you're doing to help advance this uh, conversation around R2X and make sure we're able to uh, have, as best we can, the efficient R2X pipeline uh, for much of our work. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. 
Uh, and then we'll go into a series of questions uh, for each of the panelists uh, and then open up to the audience for additional questions. Uh, and so I'll start off, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Dorothy Cope, uh, is the director of the Weather Program Office in OAR. We have Dr. Mark Monaco, uh, my colleague here in NCOS. He serves as the senior scientist uh, within NCOS and the National Ocean Service. Catherine Shumps is the deputy director of the Office of Satellite Ground Services in NESDIS. I'll also give a shout out because she is uh, my fellow cohort member from uh, LCVP class, the Transformers there. So shout out Transformers. Um, also want to uh, introduce Dr. Stephen Smith, who is the director of the Office of Science and Technology Integration in Weather Service. Uh, and lastly, Dr. Benjamin Richards, who is the acting director of the Science Operations Division of the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center, uh, part of fisheries. Uh, he is also the chair of the NOAA Artificial Intelligence Executive Committee. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today and uh, appreciate hearing your insights here on uh, R2X here. Now, I'm going to kick off with the first question. Uh, for these first two questions, we want to give each of you uh, two to three minutes uh, to provide your answer each. Uh, and Michelle, I also want to welcome you. I'll, I'll go through the panelists, but also feel free to uh, jump in with any additional commentary. Uh, you may have to uh, continue to contribute and build off your remarks as well. Okay. Uh, so let's start here. Um, first question. Can you provide examples of successful transitions from your line office and describe any unique processes, procedures, and steps your line office has in place to help ensure successful transitions? Uh, and Dorothy, how about we start with you? All right, great, thank you. So um, the Weather Program Office Director in OAR, uh, as you said, and this is, transitions are extremely important to our uh, program office. It's almost our, our top business, you might say. And so I think at our latest count, we had 126 transition plans. Um, about half of those have gotten to RL8. Um, and then about half of those have been implemented into operation, so around 2025-ish. 20, um, and so you can see there's a bit of a, a gradation, you know, from what we set out to do versus what's actually gone through. So we have a lot of experience here. Uh, we typically do require transition plans of all of our projects, and we're backing off on that a little bit, potentially, especially the lower RL, trying to fine tune it and make sure that we don't put too much of a burden on our on our principal investigators or on the, our weather service or you know whoever the recipients are. So that's a work in progress. Um, and as Michelle said, not everything is suitable for transition. So the key is to find the point at which you wanna put that hook in and really get a transition locked into place. But um, you know, it's a couple of examples, you know, I think some of, a couple of the programs that are particularly focused on transitions includes the Joint Technology Transfer Initiative. So I got a couple of examples from Chandra Kandragunta on some successful transitions. Our test bed program as well, as Michelle mentioned with the hurricanes as an example. So Jordan Dale from our test bed program gave me some examples. Um, just the you know, topics, um, the hurricane and ocean test bed implemented um, a statistical tropical cyclone intensity forecast uh, capability. Uh, working between um, Colorado State University, AOML, and uh, NESDIS, actually, or the PIs on that project. And the JTTI example is um, implementation of the hail cast hail model into the HER. Uh, so, and that's actually one that was led by a private company, AER. Um, but some things that really ensure success, and I think we'll dig into this a little bit further down, communication, communication, communication early and often <laughs> between the principal investigators and the operational recipients. You know, the sooner we can get that started, as Michelle said, and sustain that and make sure that the projects are, are adjusting and the test bed is adjust, or the, um, the operational recipient is adjusting uh, to one another's capabilities, um, that's really, really critical for success. Um, just one thing, you know, I know the test beds have, have done some work on um, developing uh, website tools. 
And so if the PI actually takes the initiative of developing a tool that can be used in the testbed um, environment by the forecasters, that, that also really helps to ensure uh, success. So I think I'll have more to say, and I don't want to use too much of my time, so I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dorothy. Uh, how about we go to uh, Ocean Service, uh, Martin Rockville. Thanks, Lonnie. Hi, folks. Uh, glad to be here today and chat about transitions. Uh, we've been fortunate over in NOS and specifically in NCOS to work on, on many different types of transitions and things that we've transitioned to others and some things were transitioned to us and we operate. Uh, some of the ones most folks on this call probably know about is our harbor auto bloom forecast. Uh, we've worked with uh, our Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services to transition the research uh, to operations with them. And as things evolve, like the Florida forecast, uh, we have completely new different uh, technology and approach. And so we're actually handling that particular forecast uh, on our own with respect to uh, providing the, the uh, daily uh, outputs for those blooms. Similarly, in Lake Erie, uh, we recently had, I guess last week, uh, a forecast on the uh, seasonal blooms and we'll move to daily uh, operational uh, activities with respect to uh, location and size of the harm product blooms in those areas. In that particular instance, uh, we now are also operating uh, as the researchers at hand, the operators, but that's in conjunction with our NOAA colleagues at Coral and, and many other partners. Uh, from our pathogen forecast work, which is all of this is kind of focused around meteorological forecast as well, uh, we've been working uh, with the National Weather Service in the Chesapeake Bay, and, and that's the one that's more along the lines of a, I guess, more traditional operational forecast where we can provide those daily time steps um, through uh, consultation with the Weather Service. And that allows us to get that information to the management community, especially at this time of the year when you're starting to understand and want to look at the real forecast and the impact on human health. And then from the side of uh, helping other folks transition their work, we work with the uh, University of Southern California, that's, uh, University of California in Santa Barbara, and where they've done the research and they turned to us and we've helped them uh, transition that to the Nessus uh, uh, Coast Wash West Coast mode. Now is uh, uh, the delivery is through uh, the Southern California Ocean Observing System. And similarly with uh, the folks at Woods Hole who have developed the forecast for the Alexandria blooms up in the Northeast, um, we provide some of the data, they develop the models, and then we're helping to disseminate that as, as the operator. Also in our ecological forecast portfolio is work that we do on species and habitat distributions and how they're changing either from uh, management aspects, uh, the impacts of management or natural uh, phenomena. Uh, things like understanding how oyster distributions uh, are impacted by changes in freshwater and the associated salinity with the waters. Uh, things like looking at how habitats are being modified by climate change. That's more along the species level, if you will, but most recently we're focused at the ecosystem level. And probably the one that's hottest in the news for us is the work that we're doing in uh, supporting the Bureau of Ocean Energy and Management in trying to define areas for offshore wind energy. Uh, in this sense, it's not with respect to a traditional uh, develop the research and just totally hand it off. It's being done in partnership with uh, the Bureau and all line offices in NOAA are part of these efforts with respect to providing data and information across all regions of the country on the potential areas for offshore wind, mostly based on where are the least amount of conflicts in space and time from other ocean industries and other ocean uses, whether that's conservation, uh, the spatial use of, of areas like aquaculture, and how does that fit in with where BOEM would like to look and uh, determine uh, where potential lease blocks would go. So our, our, our role in that really is to provide spatial models that we can help them figure out specifically places to go to minimize those conflicts with respect to location of wind, wind facilities. And I bring that up as something that's kind of unique, or at least when we talk about this transition space, is that it doesn't meet a necessarily formal definitions of what we typically talk about in NOAA, but it is a set of consistent methods, consistent models that we uh, transferred to BOEM, working with them, and uh, provides them the tools that they need to make that type of uh, 
forecast, if you will, because you're trying to predict where are the best places for that industry. As far as key steps, I think a lot of this was mentioned by Dorothy and Michelle with respect to having stakeholder engagement from the beginning. You want to know what you're uh, trying to do in immediate uh, sense and where you're trying to drive the car and what products do those stakeholders and clients need. Uh, without that, uh, you're, you're kind of shooting in the dark. So we do a lot of scoping in all of our work, but specifically in things that deal with ecological forecasts and ultimately transitions. Uh, the next one, obviously, I think is you know making sure the operational unit or whoever you think will be the operators, working with them directly, not developing something and hoping that they will take it and implement it further. You want to do that in partnership uh, and making sure in some of these instances, the, the various institutions need some time to integrate that additional work into their workflow. And some of these things uh, take some time to develop. So you want to be careful of that. And then I think the third one and the final one I'd say is be consistent with the messaging uh, to leadership on the importance of the work, uh, the resource requirements, and letting them know of any issues early on in the process uh, so that you can succeed in your transitions. So I'll end it there, Lonnie. Thank you. Thank you there, Mark. And I think uh, one of the key pieces that we heard both you and Dorothy both hit on is that strong, robust, continuous communication uh, throughout the partnership there to help drive transition. So appreciate that. Uh, how about we turn to Nesdis with uh, Catherine? Uh, again, I'll repeat the question. And for our panelists, just a reminder, uh, I didn't tell you before. I popped in the question as well, so you can see the text in the chat, just as a reminder. So just a refresh, our question is, can you provide examples of successful transitions from your line office and describe any unique processes, procedures, and steps your line office has in place to help ensure successful transitions? Uh, yeah, take it away, Catherine, two to three minutes. Thanks, Lonnie. So the office in which I work, the Office of Satellite Ground Services, that's our wheelhouse. We develop, operationalize, and sustain both systems and scientific algorithms that make critical products that go out to the public, to the no line offices, etc. And I think we've taken a really different approach here from a tactical standpoint. Agree with everything everyone has said in terms of communication, stakeholder engagement, um, and and writing plans and being able to deliver on that. I think the key is. What we're talking about is really coordination. And I think where we're trying to pivot is to collaboration. So we built and delivered the NESDIS Common Cloud Framework. On top of that sits now 14 plus data streams coming in with over 50 algorithms making over 600 operational products. And that went from the idea, the idea and an initial pilot uh, into operations in less than three years. And we have scaled it uh, in the last two. To enable that, we wanted to have make sure our processes end to end were more flexible and agile. So we've looked to developing things under agile framework methodologies, the scaled agile framework. And what that does, and then aligning our teams to that is, gives us planning teams next to our developers with our operators. Everyone's working together end to end here. That's kind of the DevOps culture we're working to create. And what that does that's different, instead of just having our traditional software reviews where we have gates and things pass over and we kind of have a handshake occurring between operations and developers, we're bringing the users, everyone to what's happening so that everyone gets involved. So the developers understand operations and they're able to turn it around quicker and with the intent of how it's being used with the stakeholders kind of giving the idea of what it should look like and what it should provide. So we're really piloting, moving in that direction by creating that really agile culture, continuing to have coding standards, continuing to deliver software that's quality, but really building together. And I think building together actually gives us not only a sense of combined ownership, but we show that by doing this, we reduce operational transition time from development from around a year to less than six months on our very first try. So that's a huge win for us and for all of NOAA in getting things into operations. And I think Michelle's point, the more we can do intra-line office, the more we can do to be collaborative as opposed to coordinating, 
to really help us to realize the value of the data and science that we do across NOAA. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Lonnie. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that shout out to co-development uh, and getting that robust understanding of what I would call how each other's world works as we're in that R&D and development, doing it early and keeping that uh, strong engagement going uh, there. I'm going to pause real quick. Are there any questions on uh, for audience questions coming in uh, in response to our first three uh, panelists? I'll just pause for just a second. No questions so far, Lonnie. Okay. All right. Uh, hearing none, uh, let's go to Weather Service, Steve Smith. Uh, again, uh, try to keep it uh, about two minutes here. Uh, can you provide examples of successful transitions and uh, what processes and, and norms and procedures do you have in place to ensure successful transition? You just took up 20 seconds of my time, Lonnie. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so uh, yes, I can. Uh, but first, let me say a couple of uh, remarks. Um, so uh, I've been in this game for a long time in my 30 year career at NOAA. And um, one of the best things implemented during that time was the concept of readiness levels, formerly called technical readiness levels. And uh, NOAA has really adopted this in, a, I think, in a very powerful way. And it allows us to have these conversations um, along these lines, which helps us when it comes to, in particular, our relationship with OAR, who work uh, mostly in the lower readiness levels in the research uh, area and, and weather service when we're operating in the higher readiness levels close to operations. And so um, I, I just want to say that that framework has been very valuable uh, to move the conversation along. However, it has its sort of dark side in which it appears to be this linear, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, bingo, you hit the target. When in fact, um, R2O, O2R is extremely nonlinear. It is it is chaotic. It is you have projects which morph into different things from their outset. They they merge with other projects. They split apart. Um, you have multiple development organizations sometimes working with multiple uh, operational units to get things done. So so the reality of R two O is much more um, I would say open you know, almost project by project. And we we try to build in you know, very robust R2O pass, but it's really challenging. And particularly when you get sort of transformational technologies like cloud compute to come along and totally disrupt what you're doing. Uh, all that said, uh, you know, we, we have uh, not to repeat what has already been said, but we've had many successful transitions. Um, looking over at Nessus, uh, the prop severe, hi, Ka Catherine, um, uh, that was a uh, uh, um, up in uh, Wisconsin, the group up there, SIMS, um, this highly valuable like thunderstorm uh, probabilistic guidance for tornadoes and severe weather, hail, and so forth. Uh, and we worked with actually NSSL, uh, another uh, an OAR office, to implement that within the MRMS system, right? So our forecasters now use that on a daily basis. So there's an example of two different NOAA entities working together to provide an end benefit to the weather service. And of course, MRMS in itself is, was a huge success story going from NSSL uh, and running on weather service um, IDP. Uh, an other example I'll, I'll put out there is the Weather and Society dashboard, which was uh, funded under the FACETS rubric. That was actually the University of Oklahoma. We worked with OAR uh, to move that into an operational uh, platform, and we're continuing to use that for uh, better understanding for our forecast office on how people use uh, weather information. Uh, there's the the uh, the hurricane analysis and forecast system, a big modeling effort, which we uh, have been working over several years, which is going operational as we speak. That involved OAR uh, labs as well as WPO and of course EMC to to make that work with lots of supplemental funding. So the funding is often piecemeal, it's some base, it's some opportunistic. MRMS was funded off of uh, Hurricane Sandy funding that became operationalized. So, so we really 
we really do what we can to get things done, and the frequent interaction collaboration is critical that, to that. Um, a more, more recent one uh, in, in an OER space with the Global Systems Labs is their DESI application, which we're using for our probabilistic uh, decision support. Uh, that was a collaboration between GSL and um, uh, the Weather Prediction Center in, uh, in College Park, as well as the, uh, the uh, Storm Prediction Center. So NSEP centers, uh, OER labs, uh, NESDIS, it's all a kind of this eclectic mix. Um, lastly, I want to just in, say, Lonnie, that uh, we have our, our safety net is our weather service transition plan review meeting. We hold that on a monthly basis. As Dorothy indicated, there's been a, a, about 125 uh, fully signed transition plans that have been worked through that. And it really is where all eyes in weather service, we invite all our portfolio offices as well as OER to sit in there as we go through like transition plan by transition plan, all eyes on it, ask whatever questions and, and sort of provide that situational awareness, coordination um, and approval to go forward. So with there, I'll stop and hand it back to you. Um, Thank you. Again, I just want to acknowledge, uh, Steve, that's a that transition plan review process. Uh, that's that's an interesting wrinkle I had not heard. So learning something today. Thanks for that. Uh, and let's go ahead and get uh, Ben in and hear the fisheries perspective. Great, thanks, Lonnie, and and thanks to all the other panelists. Um, you know, to build on on really what you know all the other panelists have, have talked about. Um, no fisheries. A lot of the work that, that we do is really governed under the Magnuson Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act. So that really provides a lot of our, our guiding principles um, around um, the, the assessment of fish stocks and living marine resources within the, the US uh, exclusive economic zone. And so a lot of our work and what I'm gonna to talk today really is, is supporting that stock assessment enterprise. And in terms of transition operations um you know the the highlight is really um our, our survey enterprise and the marine research marine resource surveys that um, go out into the field on an annual basis to provide um you know all of the abundance and life history information that is required for the, the stock assessment process to ensure sustainable fisheries uh, and then there's all the supporting technologies uh, to, to support that survey enterprise, to uh, optimize survey efforts. And so for a lot of that, you know, we, we had things like, um, I'll you know, kind of give an example of the uh, advanced sampling technology working group that was, uh, you know, ran an annual RFP for proposals for advanced technology to, to improve and optimize our survey enterprise. Uh, reduce cost of operations. And so we had a lot of different annual RFPs that were designed to sort of catalyze that, that initial research and development. And it, it they resulted in a, a really wide swath of really high quality projects, um, but they were all, you know, kind of at that RL, you know, sub RL5 level, you know, a lot of low, low RL level projects. And um, you know, a lot of people have probably heard about it and, and talk about the, the valley of death, you know, of, of trend, trying to transition projects from, you know, RL5, 6, you know, up into the, the 7, 8, 9s. And so we, we looked at that um, kind of at a national level and um, changed, changed some of our thinking a little bit and developing what we, what we called strategic initiatives that were defined by, by strategic plans of, um, dedicated focus on transitioning projects that aligned with agency priorities um, and that showed uh, high potential return on investment. And so the strategic initiatives deviated a little bit from the annual RFP process, where it was almost a little bit more of a, of a top-down directional funding mechanism to provide project candidate projects with um, sustained multi-year funding to really get through that valley of death and um, transition from research mid RL levels you know all the way up through uh, operational status and so 
Um, in doing that, uh, for the various strategic initiatives, we established steering committees, we established um, you know, communities of practice, industry stakeholder partners, and part of that steering committee's goal was really to define what operational meant in this particular domain context. You know, different projects, different line offices have different definitions of what operational means. Uh, for NOAA fisheries, a lot of that means you know, data that is, is validated, is consistent, and can be used for official management action. Um, you know, in the weather service, you know, the definition of operational um, you know, is a little different in terms of you know, real time, always available, vetted. Um, and so really you know, defining what, what operational means and then working within the steering committee and the communities of practice to, to echo what a lot of the other panelists have talked about in terms of you know, constant communication, reaffirmation of goals, uh, objectives, and then really defining who the user group is going to be, making sure that the, the transition plan um, is, is continually reviewed by the stakeholder and the end user groups, um, and making sure that the transition plan takes into account the, the scalability of a project. Um, a lot of projects try to you know, bite off everything all at once. Um, and get, get bogged down fairly quickly. And so how can each step in the transition plan build off of the previous step? Um, and I'll use you know, a specific example. Um, you know, two specific examples are, are development of uh, some software technologies to support the survey enterprise. Um, a lot of our surveys are transitioning from you know, hook and line extractive sampling, trawling, things like that, and bringing in more optical technologies for, for fishery independent and non-extractive extractive sampling. Um, the problem with optical data sets is that, you know, you generate hundreds of thousands of to millions of images, terabytes of data that all have to be processed by human analysts, um, which takes months of, of human time. So we've been trying to bring in a lot more artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision technologies, and so one of the strategic initiatives was to develop um, or resulted in the development of a, a software package called VIAME, V-I-A-M-E is the lovely acronym, uh, which stands for uh, uh, Video and Image Analysis for the Marine Environment. And it's an open source uh, software package that was developed with a, an industry partner um, to, to bring in uh, a whole variety of different optical data sets provide a modular based uh, analysis pipeline. And through that industry partner, um, we were able to, to catalyze a lot of partner funding out of um, agencies that frankly have a lot more uh, you know, budgetary power than we do, mainly DARPA, IARPA, uh, Defense Department. Um, that is also interested in the same backbone technologies. A lot of the machine learning algorithms don't really care if you're asking about fish or if you're asking about planes or tanks or missiles or people with backpacks. Um, and so being able to bring in those partners. Um, and then I mentioned that the scalability. So we, we knew that we couldn't bite off everything that we can chew all at once. We started out with, okay, what is the full domain of, of image products available to NOAA Fisheries and what are we gonna start with? So we decided, okay, we're not gonna start with, you know, we're gonna start just with in situ imagery of fish. We're not gonna worry about seals on ice. We're not gonna worry about penguins. We're not gonna worry about polar bears. You know, we'll deal with that later. And so we've been able to build the technology, build the various modules and pipelines to the extent that uh, we actually had a proposal last week to change the name from video and image analysis for the marine environment now to video and image analysis for multiple environments um, as the package has, has grown and new industry stakeholders and, and groups have, have been working with us to uh, adapt and apply new modules to that system. So that's just one you know, very specific example, um, but I think it's a good example of you know, defining what operational means, setting up a steering committee, a community of practice um, to, to catalyze that um, development, establishing a consistent and stable funding mechanism to, to keep that project going and moving forward, um, and then 
you know, as, as Stefan and others were saying, you know, just the, the constant loop of research to operations, back to research, back to operations and, and refinement um, is, has been really important. Thank you for that, Ben. And, and I appreciate coming back with that summary statement as well. I, you know, I, I think much of what you said also helped reinforce uh, some of the messaging we heard from the uh, other panelists. So thanks for that. Uh, what I want to do is be able to get um, some of the audience questions and commentary in here. And so Katie has been monitoring the um, uh, chat box from the audience there. Uh, I'm going to turn to you. Any questions from the audience, Katie? Yes, we do have one question from the audience, so I will read that off. Um, Dr. Morgan was unable to attend today, but this question for the panel comes from the previous fireside chat on this topic that he moderated in March. So this question is broken down into uh, f several smaller questions, so bear with me. Uh, can you please provide some examples of technological innovations that looked promising but did not deliver on their promise? What were some of the key factors that caused these R2X transitions to stall or not succeed? And what was learned from exploring their implementation? Last question, do you have a way to document both best practices and lessons learned? So I will put this in the chat for everyone. And for that question, we'll give you uh, essentially any volunteers on the panel want to take up. Sure, I can jump in uh, first, Lonnie. Um, I think you know a, a great example is is the RFP process, um, and and we have a, a number of projects, and I'll um, you know again just you know build on the the Viame and, and image analysis example. Um, Starting out, you know, the, and, and even now, there are you know multiple different software packages, research groups, you know, looking to to crack this same egg. Um, and I think you know one of the other things that has helped us in transition operations has been you know not putting you know all of our eggs in one basket. Not you know necessarily saying you know okay this is what's going to go forward, but um, being able to, to catalyze development along a, a variety of simultaneous fronts um, to see, you know, partially what, what naturally rises to the top. Um, there are, are different serendipitous um, occurrences that, that occur in the, the transition to operations plan. They can't necessarily be predicted. So I think the, the example or you know, the generality that I will give of, of things that have failed are things that um, a priori started out as only one path, only one way, and that uh, without the ability to to flex and transition, um, the the likelihood of success is is lower. So, in terms of developing a software package for image analysis, you know, at one point we had probably at least ten partner companies all working to develop you know things along the same line and it just happened to be you know oh the community of practice you know liked this graphical user interface a little bit better than another one or you know something was slightly different and easier here than it was there and so kind of seeing where those natural proclivities lie and being um, sensitive and, and robust to those um, has has really achieved success and the ones that that have not been as as nimble have have stalled. Yeah, Lonnie, I'm, can I jump in? Sorry, uh, I'll be quick. I promise. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a great question, and I think uh, to Michelle's point, failure is really key because you learn, and that means we should continue to invest in innovation. So I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Um, not from a scientific perspective, but on problem solving. So we, within NESDIS, uh, created an OTA and other transactional authority to work directly with Google to try to do some data simulation, create an automated pipeline. Wouldn't it just be so easy if we could just take satellite data and drop it into the assimilation like that? Uh, it sounded great, right? Um, and it, it did flex the availability. And I think um, it did flex how we thought about it and, and 
can we bake in automation? Where can we make our tools and, and use technology to deliver more value? And I think that's really, NESDA spends a lot of time focusing there. Our challenge was actually around the data. Google couldn't figure out how to use our data and was spending inordinate amounts of time cracking into it and trying to figure it out. And all of our data formats were yeah, slightly different, with slightly different uh, QC val variables. And it just kind of got to the idea that um, it couldn't really work because there was too much tailoring needed to make it from a completely automated pipeline. Could you take one data set and do it in perpetuity? Sure. But it wasn't something that could truly scale. And so that gets back to some of the things that are, uh, you know, key priorities we're working on now, which is really towards the democratization of data. How do we put it in formats that are more accessible? They're more easily used. They're very um, egalitarian, what we use now, because it's for scientists by and large, we can do better. So the lesson learned we had was, what transformations do we need to take and how do we thus democratize this so that we can implement these sorts of pipelines in the future or tweak them? So now we're really uh, focused within Nesdis on our data transformations and optimizing to user communities as well as to the technology. So I think it was a really positive failure, if you will, in that we didn't get it up and running perfectly, but we learned so much from it that I think can really parlay into future technological and scientific expeditions, uh, really focusing on improvement of data assimilation. Go ahead, Dorothy. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, um, you know, one example that comes to mind of a, of a R to X, a transition that we had planned to make, uh, we had a transition plan um, all in place and we thought we were following the procedures, you know, as, as necessary. It was a, um, I think it was a scientist from NCAR who was developing a hydrologic system that was intended to go into the national water model. And when we went to get, you know, the final, so actually, I, I don't know if they ever actually signed off on the transition plan, but anyways, the project was proceeding and then it turned out that it wasn't, uh, had it managed to stay in, in lockstep with where the water center was taking the next gen um, modeling system. So I think there, there was probably a breakdown in communication uh, so that that didn't work out. But what we've been doing instead is trying to look for other um, other places that that modeling system can be used. And so that brings to the point, um, you know, in addition to transitioning into operations uh, in the weather program office, we're also transitioning to commercialization. We transition to models that we release to the community. Um, we transition knowledge. So we're kind of broadening our perspective on what we mean by, mean by transition, you know, instead of just focusing on, on the weather service. So I think, you know, that's a lessons learned. You asked about lessons learned. I mean, I think one thing that we are doing with the weather service is developing uh, documentation of, of the best practices and processes for transitions uh, between uh, at least the weather program office and, and STI and the weather service. Um, but, but that's, so we're getting started on that and hopefully we can, you know, really start to, it'll be a living document that we can continue to revise as we go. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just give one quick one. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, dating myself now, but there was a, NSSL had an application called the Warning Decision Support System, WDSS. And uh, it was basically taking advantage of the NexRAD system, adding some additional algorithms to it and providing a way to like sort convective storms, see in a given uh, radar, umbrella which which storms were more likely to produce severe weather uh, and it was interactive they developed it they prototyped it uh, they put it in weather service offices they took it to the olympics in atlanta and uh, and so it seemed to be a very popular thing and so uh, the office i was working with at the time we we took the concepts and we translated they translated them into an awips application called scan and we actually implemented that application. It remains in the baseline, you know, 25 years later, it's still out there in AWIPS. Um, but we did not really uh, test this in a test bed with forecasters much. We kind of assumed things that what we did, uh, that NSSL had sort of already done that and our translation would just slide in, uh, but that was a bad assumption. And uh, what, what it turned out is that uh, forecasters who are really experienced in, in um, 
using the radar felt that it was an insult to have this kind of a thing and they they just paid no attention to it. They were more content to analyze the, the radar uh, manually. Uh, it did, it, for more novice forecasters, it, it did find some limited uh, benefit and still used today to some degree. But I would, I would hesitate to say it was a resounding success, right? And I think it would have been better if we had more got it battle ready by working it through, iterating in a testbed environment saying like, is this good, is this not good, et cetera, before we actually went all the way to operations. So that was a, a lesson learned that I've carried forward to this time that it's really important to, to, to prove out the concepts in a quasi-operational setting in that RL, you know, five, six, seven range before you go all the way to nine. Even if you have the money and the authority to go all the way to RL9, you don't want to, you know, uh, you don't want a clunker to land in operations because then you're going to be stuck with it uh, for a long time. Thanks, Lonnie. Thank you for that, Steve. Uh, and I'm just uh, keeping a look at them time. We got about eight minutes or so. Um, I'm going to try to get one more audience question in here. Uh, Mark, no, I'm not sure. I want to give you a shot. Did you want to give a shot at answering this question, or we can move to uh, uh, next audience question? Anything you wish to add? Yeah, Let, let's go to the next audience question. I think folks cover everything from the technological, making sure that we have that in our act together. It's a, it's okay. All right, sounds good. Uh, Katie, do we have another audience question? We do. Uh, this is a question for all the panelists, so please uh, just speak up. Does the pursuit of operational transitions hinder our ability to take risks and conduct innovative research, potentially hindering the potential to find better solutions? Why or why not? All right, Lonnie, I'll jump in on, on this one. Um, well, I think we've, we've talked a bit about the fact that it's okay to fail. So at least from my perspective, we've done things that are in the experimental realm and the research realm that we ultimately want to transition, but it hasn't driven the fact that there could be failure. It hasn't driven us away like, oh, we can't do that because we have to have something that's line of sight that's, that can be uh, immediately transitioned and show us success. So uh, at least over in NOS, I have not felt that we had any concerns from that standpoint. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> jump in and and you know i think um you know, it's a really important question um because it, it certainly can happen um and it's kind of what we talk about in terms of the the balance between basic and applied research um and so i think you know dorothy actually mentioned it in in her opening you know statements where you know for for a while there was a, a pendular swing that you know every research project had to have a transition plan from the moment of inception um, and things like that can you know start to stifle some some innovation um, but we've we've backed off on a lot of that and you know okay at what point in the RL process does it make sense to have a transition plan um, to make sure that that we don't stifle innovation and also um, I talked about it a little bit in terms of, of having somewhat separate funding streams for research and development and transition to operations. I would just, Ben basically said what I was going to say, um, and just to reiterate that, you know, trying to lighten the load and the requirement on transition plans at low readiness level. We just had an innovation competition out this past year. And so that's a, a good example of projects where we're really trying to push people to think a little outside the box. Um, but we want to continue to make it easy by lightening the requirements of, you know, what do we mean by transition plan at a low RL? And maybe it's enough to say, well, you know, this is how we're going to meet no emission. And this is kind of the, the general direction we're headed in. And you know we share it with our operational partners just so they know what we're up to, but they don't need to you know have a look and approval on every single one of them. So that will open the aperture a little bit, um, a little bit more on uh, innovation. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. No, go ahead, Ben. Uh, just really quickly, I'd also be a little remiss if I, you know I, we didn't give a shout out to Fiona um, and really having the Office of Research. And, and transition um, facilitating and helping researchers who are really focused on the research and, and helping them and giving them resources to make, you know, to, to 
reduce the, the barrier of developing a transition plan and things like that. Th that's the type of thing that we can do to um, not stifle initial research while also catalyzing transition operations. Yeah, the, 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 this is, go ahead, Ronnie. Go ahead, Steve, and I want to make sure to reserve time for Catherine. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, this is a really great question, and, and the, the pendulum goes back and forth on this, right? So we've often, weather service, we said, to uh, OER and others like work within our operational systems to do your innovation. And that way, when something's proven out, we can just like pop it into our operations. And, and, uh, and that has uh, not worked out all that well <laughs> for a variety of reasons. And I do think it, it does tend to stifle innovation because really the value of o, uh, you know, OER and uh, other R&D units is to do the things that we operations can't do to like be blazing this trail. And if they're constrained too much, then I, I, I feel that's problematic. So uh, that's why I've been emphasizing this idea, like demonstrate stuff. I don't care what software you use or what system you use. If you demonstrate new concepts that, that are highly valuable, that's, that's really the nugget. We can figure out how to operationalize those concepts um, and you, you know, you're not responsible for that. Don't worry about it. You're the 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 gold you provide is the new ideas, the new innovations, the techniques, and so forth. Uh, and so, um, but recognizing that a lot of OER labs uh, are forced in this position of chasing reimbursable money. So if they they build a prototype and they sell it to some other group, then that helps their soft money issue. So, it, but it dilutes their ability to do operations. Uh, uh, excuse me, to do more fundamental things uh, that, that help us out. So uh, great question, thanks. Yeah, I think this is the quandary of NOAA, is we want very much to take all of the goodness and the investment we're making in amazing scientific innovation and provide value to the public. That's what we want to do. The challenge is not every single idea is necessarily what we want to take into operations. And I think um, looking at it from a technological perspective too, like there are new ways to do things, demonstrate, do everything you can. But we get into, at least in NESDES, this thought that, okay, we made this investment and success equals operational transition. And so I think there's also an element of how do we give the space for risk taking? be it on our systems, on our processes and our science. And I think it's more cultivated in the scientific world in terms of you know, grants, proposals, our, our approaches there. But I wonder to solve this as an ecosystem across all of NOAA, um, are there opportunities to uh, look at risk alignment from that end-to-end -end perspective? Uh, because if we say always the destination is operations, uh, you have to operationalize. That's how how you know it's a successful project. That does limit kind of how things happen. And so, Steve, I think you're right. There is an element of can we open up that space? Can we make it broader? Can we allow people to do things and then figure out a way to bring it together meaningfully at the end? So I I just I think it's our intent to deliver value to the public, to do better with our science and our data. That can sometimes just kind of have us in this pipeline blinder. Uh, and I think we need to make more opportunities for innovation because that's where we fundamentally move the needle forward for the organization. Thanks, Lonnie. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, great way to wrap that uh, question here. Uh, I'm gonna give us, we only have about three minutes and I wanna turn it to Fiona to close us out here. Uh, if we have one more audience question, and just quick responses there. Katie, do we, can we get one more audience question? Panelists, very quick responses to it. Uh, yes, our next question is, can you please share any advice for research scientists who are interested in R2X and are developing experimental forecast products but are relatively new to the process? So 30 second answers. I'll, I'll go first. As is, find the find your local program office and make sure that you you pitch your stuff to the people who control the money. That's number one. So talk to me.
talk to Dorothy and whoever else, because um, you're not going to go far unless you get funding. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would say our, our program managers are very open to talking to people who have questions or concerns. Go to the WPO website and pick the program that aligns best with, with your interests and you know, you'll, you'll get an answer. So we're here to help. I think the only thing I would say is you know, that um, you know, keep in mind that the, the best science is absolutely necessary, but not sufficient. If you're going to transition into operations, how are people going to use it? What's the barrier to use? Uh, how are you going to, you know, in, in the private sector parlance, how are you going to get market share? Um, so, you know, keeping that in mind that, you know, the best science is necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah, I think from that's from that point is trying to scope out exactly from end to end what you want to accomplish with that research. And as I think Catherine said, how is that going to help society in general or whoever we're serving? And so not focusing just only on the peer research, but have a vision of where you want that research to go. And the only thing I can add to that, as we don't do as much hard science work in NSDIS, is collaborate. Uh, find collaborators where you can, even if it flexes how the data is being used or what your scientific outcome is. Uh, there are lots of opportunities of funding, and the more cross-cutting we can be, I think, the more it will help you uh, find the right funding streams and opportunities to advance your work. Thank you for that. I appreciate those uh, answers there. Uh, so, panelists, I appreciate all the insights that you've shared with us here over the last uh, hour or so. Thank you for the commentary and audience. Thank you a lot for the uh, questions there. Uh, really helping to drive this thing. Uh, with that said, Fiona, I will uh, turn it back over to you now. Um, thank you so much, Lonnie, for moderating this panel. This has been great. And just by the by, on the side, I've been getting feedback from people and they really valued your comments. And so thank you for that. I want to just say, say a couple of things. First of all, Ben, thanks for the shout out for Orta. Um, you know, yay. Um, and um, also on, on the uh, issue of risk, um, you know, we're looking at transition plans at RL4 and above. And, um, you know, that what people should know is that transition plans are just a roadmap and they are not a binding document. And we say that they're living documents. And we've actually got cases right now where um, people's research has changed and the, you know, the end goal has changed and we're modifying their transition plans too. So I think that there is flexibility there and um, allowance for risk. Um, so what else did I want to say here? Um, yes, yeah, so that we're, and also as, as Ben noted that we are making it very simple for you. So we've got a, a bunch of um, um, transition plan templates on, online, but we also offer one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one support to people who are addressing questions like you know, um, innovation and they have an idea and they want to put it in writing. So uh, we're more than happy to help with that. So with that, um, we need to close it out now. I just want to let you know that um, I want to, again, thank Lonnie and Michelle and to all the panelists, because this has just been great. Uh, as Katie said, this will be recorded and it will be posted on the Orta website. Um, we are looking at the next fireside chat to be in the October timeframe, and we will be addressing recent examples of on the ground transition plans uh, recently developed across NOAA. So that's kind of the general theme. Um, we're refining that. And um, please look out for that next announcement. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Katie. Thank you so much, Fiona. And thank you again to all panelists. Um, we are ending our time here. It is 1.15. Thank you, everyone, uh, attendees, for attending. And we'll have this up on the YouTube channel so you can all uh, revisit it there. If we didn't get to a question, uh, we will make sure that gets to the panelists today. Thank you all and have a wonderful, safe rest of your day. Take care.